You can go ahead if you have your Bibles and turn over to 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 this morning. And we're going to be looking at verses 2 uh, through 16. This passage we come to in our study of the book 1 Corinthians is a text, these verses uh, 2 through 16, that uh, has oftentimes been offensive to some, some people uh, in, in the church, especially uh, women, because it, it deals with the, the subject matter of authority and the order of subjection uh, in the church. And I'm going to go ahead and read the text this morning, right now, and then we'll, we'll get started here. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off, or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and the glory or and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, contentious we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. Before we get into this text itself, I want to read uh, an excerpt from the commentary. Uh, it's John MacArthur's commentary. And I would want to, want to mention too, to those who want to read up on this subject matter here, because oftentimes we get derailed. And what I found as I studied this over again, this time through, for, for today's message, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm well read on this. I spent a lot of time reading on this. We get derailed on the head covering issue. Uh, and we, we, we're, we make it an issue of, of should a woman's head be covered when she's in church or uncovered. And we make it a, uh, an issue uh, of the culture of the day and whether the church is in compliance or it isn't or what. But the issue of the text is the order of subordination and authority in the body, in, 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 in the culture. Uh, I, I believe he even speaks outside of church, but the immediate context he's dealing with within the worship service, how things ought to look uh, and be within the church context, within the Christian community. We will talk about the cultural issue uh, of, of the, the head covering, uh, the need thereof or, or not, but, but it's in the greater whole of the truth of the text which we'll get to. But I want to read what MacArthur says as he opens this, uh, this uh, portion of his commentary, this, this text where we're at. He says this, The role of women has become a battleground in society during the last several decades. 
The struggle for women's, women's rights has escalated to a place of imbalance in society that threatens the future. In our day, the efforts of the enemy began with secular society and worked back into the church, which so often catches the world's diseases and adopts the spirit of the age. Some leaders and writers in the name of Christianity have gone so far as to reach principles that attempt to redefine or even alter biblical truths to accommodate the standards of contemporary thinking in the world. To do that, of course, they have to believe that Paul, Peter, and other scriptural writers added some of their own opinions to God's revealed truth, or that the apostles sometimes taught culturally determined customs rather than divinely revealed standards. When that approach is taken, man must decide for himself what part of Scripture is revealed and what is not, making him the judge over God's Word. Satan feverishly tries to upset the divine order in any way he can, and one foundational way is by perverting male-female roles in relationships. And to that I say, Amen. Uh, he's dead on. Uh, w w our, our culture today, secular culture, men and women, it, it, it is just, it, it's whatever. Uh, gender seems to be whatever you choose to make it, and it doesn't matter what sex you are born with. It, it, and there's no d distinction, and, and our culture teaches there shouldn't be. There should be just this, you know, uh, I don't, don't want to say unisex, but this acceptance of whatever as we define it, and that's not what God's word teaches. I'm just that I'm just saying that. That's from Genesis one forward. God does not teach that at all in His word. But MacArthur said something in here, and I and I want to quote it again. He said, "Some leaders and writers in the name of Christianity have gone so far as to teach principles that attempt." that attempt to redefine or even alter biblical truths, and here's what he says, to accommodate the standards of contemporary thinking in the world. Well, I want to say this as it relates to me. I'm not one of those guys. That's not who I am. Yeah, I believe God has called me to preach and to teach His Word. Not my word, not the secular world's word, uh, not what, what other preachers defined the word to be, but my job is to look at the word of God, to do the best I can, to study God's truth, to rightly divine it, to divide it so that I can preach and teach it to God's people so that we can be in compliance with his truths. That, that's, that's my heart. That's my heart. And that's who, who I am. And I, I tend today to, to preach this passage. As I studied this passage, and I look at it, I realize that uh, what God, when he, what, what He's teaching here, there should be no offense to this. I'm just being honest with you. If you find offense with this, then you need to drop down right off the bat and look at verse 16 and ask God to work in my heart to where this isn't how I'm sitting here today. To be browbeat. Because this isn't a browbeating thing. This isn't an issue of superiority or inferiority at all. That's not what's here. What's here is God's designed order within His church. And within His creation. This is what God set up. It's not an issue of chauvinism or feminism. Both, by the way, are unbiblical. They're not biblically taught in Scripture at all. And, and furthermore, Christianity, and I'm jumping way ahead of the barn here, I mean the horse, Christianity has done more to liberate women than anything that's ever been in, in this world. It has actually uh, freed women to be as God intended them to be and to have that freedom. All the ancient cultures and even cultures that exist today oppress women. Big time. Christianity allows women to be women and to be appreciated as, as, uh, and, for, as and for what God created them to be, who they are. And so Christianity is, is the best thing that ever happened uh, to women. 
as far as their rights go. But anyway, we want to move into this, and when we look at this, uh, I, I would say this, it, just by way of, of, of uh, setting this up, when you take a, a, a company, I mean, by way of this order of subordination, let's say Caterpillar, for example, and I'm going to oversimplify their various stations or breakdown in authority, but when you take a, a company like Cat or whatever, you've got management, you've got four, it breaks down to foremans or, or, or you know, a, superiors on the floor, then you've got the, 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 the assemblyman, you've got a breakdown in, 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 in authority. There's authority that, that has greater authority and it's broken down. What is that for? If you didn't have it, you'd have mass confusion. That's what you would have. It, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to produce anything because everybody would want to be a chief and no one would be an Indian, and no one would be in a role. And it's not a matter of, is the boss smarter than the lowest guy? Because I'm going to tell you, I've worked under bosses that I had to say, man, this guy, he's not very sharp at all, you know? But yet, he's the boss, and he's in the position, and if I want to get my paycheck, and I want to get the product or, 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 or perform the service that needs to be performed, I, gotta, I yield to that. That's just how it works. It's not an issue of, sub of superiority. It's an issue of the breakdown. And, and so too as we come to the, the scriptures here. Look at, look at uh, and, I, and I'm not looking at this text here, but in 1 Corinthians 14.33 it states, God is, is the author, is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Then we're told later in 14 and verse 40 that he wants everything in his church done decently and in order. He doesn't want confusion on these matters. It's when we break from our roles, and I'm talking children to parents, husbands to wives, people within the body of Christ, men and women, uh, whatever the, 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 the positions, that's when we get in trouble. That's when we see confusion. That's when we see disunity. And that's when we fail to reach God's purposes uh, as, as a body. But within the structure of the church, we have an established order of authority uh, and subordination so that we are able to function as God intended. And there's the issue. As God intended. Because that's what matters. That's what matters to me, and that's what should matter to all of God's people. And this is the truth that Paul touches on today. And what we learn here in this text is this, if you're taking your notes. Men and women who participate in a worship service, that's the immediate context of what's here. I believe it goes beyond this, and, and I'll talk about that later, but uh, who participate in a worship service are to demonstrate proper submission or subordination to God's authority. Whatever your, put, uh, whatever your gender, whatever your place, there is to be a, a submission uh, to, uh, subordination to God's established authority as He's uh, ordered it to be. Now the question is, what's involved? How do we, what, what, what's involved with that? How do we do that on our parts? How do we do that to demonstrate proper subordination in, in the church? And subordination to God's authority. Well, as we look at this text this morning, we're going to see four points that Paul makes concerning subordination that we need to understand in order to properly demonstrate that. To properly respond to the teaching that we see set forth here in our text this morning. Now I want to get into our text and I want to look at the first point we need to understand. And the first point we need to understand is this. God has an ordained order of, of subordination. God has an ordained order of, sor uh, of subordination. When I say ordained, I mean ordained by God. It's not one he picked out of anything. This is how he set it forth. This is how God set it forth to be. And this is verse 3. He says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now notice that I said, 
God has this system. This is God's system. It's not anybody else's. This is how he laid it down here in, in, in verse 3. Uh, and it says, it is, it, is, it is his structure here. Here's the way it breaks down. First, Christ is the head of every man. I have no problem with that. That shouldn't be a problem for any believer. Christ, as we all know, is declared to be the head of the church. He is our Savior. He is our Lord, our Master. He is the one who is the chief of the church. He is the head shepherd. The reason being is that he, according to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, uh, and also other texts, many, uh, he's the one who has redeemed us and brought us out of the, the marketplace of sin. He bought us at the price of his own blood. No Christian, no Christian questions the fact that Christ is the head. We're good with that. For the most part, that's not a problem. But understand what that means. If he's the head, it means he's the sovereign. He's the authority. He is the foremost authority. And He is the head of every man. He is man's head. The man answers to Christ. Now, I, not only in gender, the man, but every person, every man, is subject to Christ's authority. His divine authority. Whether they readily accept that or not, He has been given authority by God uh, uh, of everything uh, on earth and in heaven and under the earth. He has absolute sovereignty. Many, many reject that. And the reason I bring this up is that's why we have the mess we have in our culture. The reality is, is that when we fell, it was a usurping of God's authority. Ultimately, Christ's authority. Who is the authority that we're looking at here? He is God. And we usurp that. The world usurps that. Satan usurps that. And he twists whatever he can twist to, to bring confusion and disorder to God's work. God's purposes and ultimately God's people individually as well. He wants us in, in, in a mess. That, that, that's, that's what He would have for all of us. But the reality is we know from Philippians chapter 2, 10 and 11 that the day is going to come when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess in heaven and under the earth uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So who's the number one authority in the church? Christ is the head of every man. He's in total control of all men now and forever. He's the authority. Second, in the order of subordination, is this. The man is the head of the woman. Now this is the part that stirs up trouble in our culture. And it does. I'm, I'm sure some women here today even, in their gut, are like, oh, I don't want to hear this. But the reality is, is it's right here. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's what it says here. He is the head, the man is the head of every woman. The principle of subordination relates to all men and women. Understand that. Do you understand that? What did he just say? Christ is the head of how many men? Every man. There's subordination already in place. It's to God. Then he says the man is to be, or is, not is to be, but is the head of the woman. What's he saying? This is how God set it forth. This is God's will. This is God's way. This is how it's supposed to work. Not just to husbands and wives. We, we see this repeated in the Scriptures as it relates to husbands and wives. But it's not just to husbands and wives. In fact, I truly believe it extends beyond the church and the family to all aspects of society. And you may say, boy, how can you say that? Well, if you spent the hours I've spent in this text, you might reach the same conclusion. Because he goes right back to the creation record to make his case. And I'm telling you, we're in the mess we are because men aren't men and women aren't women anymore. 
in this culture. And you say, well, as you define it? No, as God defines it. I'm not saying that they need to be barefoot and pregnant and in the home. I'm not saying that. That's chauvinistic. I'm not saying that. But that is God's design. That they are, their wombs are what brings forth the children. Their primary purpose as children are given is that they rear and nurture those children in the, in the admonition of the Lord. But the, what I'm getting at is the perversion. The perversion is what we see happening in our society. And that's Satan's goal here. But that's not as God intends it to be. Secular feminists and Christian feminists have a hard time with this idea that man, that man is to be the head of the woman. They feel this is male chauvinism. This is chauvinistic. They feel that God is a chauvinist. And you say, I don't know if they feel that. I've had them say that. I've had women tell me that. That if that's your God, He's a chauvinist. And so are you. If you teach that the woman should be in submission to the husband, if you teach those things, you're a chauvinist. Well, listen, this, this, what we have, this isn't even the issue at all of chauvinism. God established this principle here of male authority and female subordination for the purpose of order that's what's here for the purpose of order and to complement one another. That's why he established this breakdown. We're all under subordination, by the way. I could, you know, I, I, the lost world doesn't even want to be subordinate to Christ. We're okay if we're all on equal ground with Christ. We just don't like the idea that God then takes a step and says, man is the head of the woman here. But he did not establish it on the basis of male superiority. I want you to understand that. I want you to hear that. As human beings and as Christians, women are, are equal to, to men uh, spiritually. We see that in Galatians. It's taught there is neither male nor female with the Lord. As it relates to our person and Him, our relationship with God, we are equal. He loves us the same. It has to do with our function within the church context. The church context, and I want to say this: I I know, and you know as well as I do, that some women are even superior uh, to to men, and in, in not only intellectually but uh, athletically, uh, maturity wise, spiritually, they can be uh, uh, heads far and away. Uh, more advanced than, than, than a man can. So th that isn't the issue. The fact of the matter, God set up an order of subjection, an order of subordination, and the woman is to be subject to the man. Now, many may say that that's, it's just not fair. <laughs> you know, it's just not fair. And I'm going to tell you, that's what we hear in our culture. That's what the Christian community has had to, to, to deal with. That's why many pastors pair their messages and, and temper them way down so that they can soft pedal this and get out with their hair. I lost mine, so I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm not afraid of that. The reality is, is it's God's Word. It's not, a, it's not an offensive thing. And maybe I'm, I'm beating the, the, the drum too much, but I think that our culture has made us feel like to say this is we're backward, we're antiquated, and we're missing the boat. And that's just not the case. And we'll, we'll see this developed as we move on. When you look at the culture throughout the world, as I stated earlier, Christianity shines as it relates to women and their rights and their equality as it relates to God and their place. Uh, you, you could take any, many cultures out there where women are literally possessions and, and, and many cultures where women, and especially in ancient cultures where they were just basically sexual objects and they were often the, the delegated basically for prostitution. Uh, that, that's what they were for. 
And in, the, in this culture, this becomes the backdrop for this passage, by the way. Because Corinth was a, a cesspool uh, of paganism, and they had a thousand temple prostitutes uh, that, that served uh, 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 in the temple Aphrodite, and it was Greek culture, and, and they, they, were, they were messed up, and it's out of this culture that God is bringing forth a local church. And so there are issues of these perversions of roles that have taken place culturally that, that are being addressed by Paul as it relates to this church. But anyway, the third breakdown is this, and God is the head of Christ. God is the head of Christ. Now, I, did, I, did you see, see what he did? First he said, every man is subordinate to Christ. And the man is the head of the woman, meaning that the man is to have authority, or he is in, in, in a position where women, uh, the woman should submit to that authority. And then he says, and God is the head of Christ. What, what, what's that do for you? What, what it should do is, is nullify verse 16, the contentions we have with this. Because what he's saying is, is even Christ, who has never been before, during, or after the incarnation in any way, inferior to the Father. Never inferior to the Father, yet He placed Himself in subjection to the Father at incarnation. He submitted. He subjected Himself totally to the Father's will to fulfill the divine purposes. The Lord did. Why did He do that? Well, the authority and submission of each of these cases that we've looked at here is to be based on love and not tyranny. It's to be based on love and not compulsion. We do what we do. I submit to Christ because I love the Lord. We submit to, Christ submitted to the, the Father because He loves the Father. The woman can submit to the husband because she loves the husband, but she loves the Lord. It's loving God. It's, it's doing this because God, we're all in subordination to God, and He set it forth. Christ rules out of love. We submit in love. And likewise, men are to exercise their authority in the church, in love. And women are to respond lovingly by being subordinate and willing to do that. That's, that's what it's supposed to look like. Not because of compulsion, not because of, of rule, not because of superiority or inferiority, but because we love the Lord and God set it up to be this way. Now let's move on to the second point we need to understand. This truth is to be applied, the, the, this order of subordination is to be applied to our lives. Look at 4 through 6. 4 through 6. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man... Ought, for a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. We'll stop right there at 6. I want to cover those parts first. But before I do, I want to read one more excerpt, by the way. Uh, I, I was going to mention, if you want to read on this, MacArthur did a very good job, I have to say that, on this portion in his commentary. He did a really good job. Uh, the, the Expositor's Bible Commentary did, did a decent job, and I really liked uh, Gromacki on this. They did, they did a really good job. They, really, they hit on some points that uh, you, you're not going to get reading. I mean, with the language. There's things in the language that are very interesting. 
uh, in, in the, this, this passage. But anyway, I, I do want to read uh, the intro on these verses out of the uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says, These verses have evoked considerable difference of opinion about the nature of the head covering and the place of woman both in public worship and in her relationship to the man. The head covering has been taken to be either a veil or shawl or else hair, either long or short. As to the use of veils, women in the ancient Orient were veiled in public or went among strangers. And that was considered out of decency because they didn't want, a woman did not want somebody else to be attracted to her beauty at all. That was reserved for her husband. That, that was the decent thing that was done here. But going on, because he says something. As to the use of veils, women in the ancient Orient were veiled in public or went among strangers, but otherwise they were unveiled. Note that Rebekah was unveiled till she met Isaac. And then he goes on and he quotes James Hurley, notes that in contrast, ancient pottery shows Greek women in public without head coverings. So what, what I'm getting at is that even in the ancient culture where they practice head covering with a shawl or something, there were times they didn't wear those all the time. Everywhere they went, they didn't do that, even in the ancient culture. They have pottery that shows the ancient women without their heads covered, and, and uh, other places that the, well, we know of that where they weren't covered. But when they were among strangers and that, they would cover the, 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 themselves, the, their hair. But anyway, their head. In Corinth, the women may well have gone to public meetings without veils. But the question is whether Paul is talking about the use of veils in public worship or about women letting their hair long hang loose, which was a sign of mourning or shame uh, uh, of an accused adulteress, rather than having their hair uh, put up. So, so what I, the reason I share that, that particular excerpt is this. You, you read, go, go, I challenge you. You can come in my office, get the commentaries. I'll stack them up for you. Go read them. But, but what you're going to find is there's confusion all over the place as to what actually was going on and what the cultural thing was. But I will say this. Across the board, everybody seems to agree that this was a cultural thing, obviously. In their culture... There were, they were using head coverings of some kind. Both the men, it had infiltrated in the church because he has to correct that. Men were covering their head. And we find that the Jewish community in the 4th century started covering their heads. That is contrary to the teaching of Scripture, by the way. And Paul corrects that. But the women were covering, wearing some type of head covering. I do not believe that, that what this text uh, teaches, I believe they're in agreement as well, is that there were literal head coverings that they wore, that they used in the services, especially, especially when they were involved in any way in the worship service. In the worship service. Now, what my, 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 but what I'm saying is, is as to what was going on culturally as it related to hair length and cropped and this and that, we have to piece it together with what we, we can find. And there were issues that it related to the length of hair with the women as well. Uh, it seems that the temple prostitutes wore their hair cropped. They, they, they had cut their hair. And in light of the Christian liberty passages, women were taking maybe that, you know, knowing that they were free. These aren't issues like meat offered to idols. These aren't issues that make or break a person as it relates to a cultural mandate or, or, or norm. They, they were coming into the church and not practicing that which signified this order of subordination. That's what was going on. The issue is not the headdress. I'm saying that straight out. That's not the issue. The issue is subordination and will we function 
as God has laid it out. Because what was happening in Corinth, they were taking these what had become the cultural symbols of that subordination, and they were throwing these off, and ultimately he's like, if you're going to do that, then you're confusing the issues, what's really at play here, and that is, is that man is different than wo a woman. And a woman is different than a man. And that distinctive should exist clearly in the body of Christ. There should be no questions as to who the man is and who the woman is. As to appearance and as to function in the body of Christ and in the community. And that, that's the real issues that's, that are in play here. But anyway, this next principle is we have to apply this. And first in, in, in this section, Paul illustrates the principle by applying it to a cultural custom which the Corinthians had, which was the covering of the head. Now you might say, the, uh, the, uh, what's, what does this have to do with the order of subordination, and that's the, what we were just talking about. Well, it was the custom of the Corinthian people for a man not to have his head covered while praying or prophesying. This was to show proper worship and reverence. So Paul states this in verse 4, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. So they're not, they shouldn't cover their head. So he raises that question. On the other hand now, in order for the woman to demonstrate the proper order of subjection to God and man, the custom was she was to have her head covered. Look at verse 5. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now I'm going to say this and I'm going to get to this later because we'll deal with this over in chapter 14. Everybody jumps on this and we've got to be careful not to jump on this and say, oh, the women were prophets in the early church. They were exercising the gift of prophecy. There's four women in the book of Acts that, that had the gift of prophecy that we're told of. They had that. And, and you have to understand that God's Word was not completed like it is today. And it came, His Spirit would come upon uh, those, those people, bring a word of truth to them, and they would share that. God speaking through them to men. And when they prayed, uh, man uh, speaking to God, they were to have their head covered. So while they were in any type of capacity uh, involved with the worship service, their head was to be uh, covered. And that's what he says. So what am I saying? Are we supposed to have our heads covered today? And I'm going to answer it simply this way. I do not believe that we at Prairie Bible have to have our heads covered here. Because that's not our custom nor our culture. We have never, we have never as a, our church, covered our head to show the distinction in authority. We don't do that. So what I would say is, is as it relates to the cultural norms of the time in their culture, as they knew what that represented, they needed to have their head covered. Because to put that off was to disregard that structure of subordination. Well, that's not the culture today, for the most part, by and large. There are groups that have that as a cultural thing within their church, and they use this passage to mandate that, but the reality is there is a cultural context. But if that is the heartbeat of their church, and has been, and it's not a legalistic thing, and it's something that they utilize to show the proper order of subordination, I have no problem with the person wearing that. But in our church, and in other churches, in our culture, for the most part, by and large, that is not what we have. We, we, we don't operate that way. And you say, well, how can you say that? Well, we just came out of a passage where we're dealing with meat offered to idols. So to say that, oh, you're minimizing this to a cultural thing. No, I'm not. Paul's the one who started it. He started with meat sacrificed to idols. I'm, I go to the meat market. I don't have an issue. You know, we don't do, deal with those things now. Why? Because we don't have idol. We don't have those things. That's what we're talking about. So he uses this to, to, because it was part of their 
their lives. So I don't believe that we necessarily have to have that uh, because it is a cultural thing. But there's nothing in, and I make this point, there's nothing in the wearing or the not wearing of a head covering itself that was right or wrong. Okay? Here's the issue, and this is what I stated. It is the rebellion against God-ordained roles that is wrong. That's it. Go, go read this, I'm telling you. And, and take some time to read what he says here. And then you'll start seeing this and you're like, that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about, are we going to function as God made man and made woman and, and Christ's authority over us? Are we going to yield and be subordinate as his people? It's this rebellion against God's ordained rule that's at issue. And in Corinth, that re rebellion was demonstrated by women praying or prophesying with their heads uncovered. And I will go as far as to say, and many commentators picked up on this as well, that many women were coming in there with their heads cropped, their hair cropped. And, it, and we'll find in this text, he is going to lay out that the hair... The beautiful hair that God gives women was given as a covering. It is their covering. By creation, women's hair, and, and, and there was one commentator, I, I could tell you all about this too now, uh, it, 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 there, it stays in a certain phase longer than the men, men's hair does. And so their hair is more luxurious, it grows longer, for by and large, by and large, there are exceptions with, with the fall and illness, you know, different kinds of issues. But by and large, women have a beautiful head of hair uh, more often than men. Men's hair just, uh, they grow great hair, but, but it usually tends to be shorter naturally. And he's going to make that case here in a moment. But when we look here at verse 6, Paul states now, and, and to this, Paul states about them praying and prophesying. Look what he says. He says, For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or, or her head shaved, let her cover her head. So what's he saying here? Here's what he's saying, and I'm going to boil it down. He says, If you're not going to conform to God's ordained order of subordination, but you're going to rebel against it, then look the part. He's saying if you're really going to rebel, then go ahead and just go all out. Look the part. Shave your head. Do what the prostitutes do. Do, do what the world does. And show the world, just let's be right up front about it. If you're not going to do what, and, and submit, then let's, let's look the part. That's what he's saying. Go, go all the way. Go all out. Let, let's, just, let's just lay it out there and, and do this. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have a shaved head, then cover your head. And what he's saying is culturally, to have that head look like a man's was not acceptable. It was a shameful thing. It was a shameful thing. And he says, cover your head. If it's a disgraceful thing in the culture, and this is what it, what what, the, what what we've accepted as as a as a symbol of this, then cover your head. Paul's point here is that there is to be, and I want you to hear this because this is in here, is there is to be a visible difference between men and women, and that difference represents God's order. So this idea of women dressing like men and men dressing like women, that should never happen in God's community, in the Christian community. And that, that speaks to the perversion of our culture. Because we're twisting the roles. We see it happening in, 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 in many different ways, in many different relationships. And we see this perversion of the roles, and it should never happen in the body of Christ. So if we're not going to have our heads covered to distinguish men and women, and by the way, I want to say this culturally, most of the people wore robes, men and women alike. And so they would all they would the women would cover their head 
because they looked very they could look very similar and the men would cut their hair shorter by and large the only, by and large long hair like a woman to grow your hair like a woman's hair was a disgraceful thing you say well what a minute what about the Nazarite vow only for for those exceptions and though, and understand what the Nazarite vow was about. It had to do with the shame of the nation. You were doing something because you were recognizing the shame of the condition of the nation, or or what. It, so so it involved a representation of a shameful thing. It wasn't a noble thing. And you say, well, well, the, what about uh, Samson? That was a peculiar thing where God did this. Uh, and as a judge, and he hid his, the, the, put his power, if you will, through his hair, his strength in that, and he had this great hair. But, but that's a, that's, that's a, uh, we're, we're trying to make a, an exception, the, the norm, you can't do that. But what's clear here, and this, my point is, is there's to be this difference. So if you're, if we're in our churches, and we are not dressed, if we're not dressed, and I even believe in the dress, to be honest with you. Not that women have to wear dresses, but I'm just saying, a woman should look like a woman and a man should look like a man. Period. In the community. And I believe in our culture, in our societies. And, and that's here. But dress is a cultural thing, and unless what a person wears is immodest or sexually suggestive, it has no moral or spiritual significance. But if it confuses the genders, there's an issue. There's an issue there. Because God made us different. <laughs> he wants us to understand. We're different. We're different. And He's going to make His case here, which to me was a mind blower. Because there was a couple things jumped out here that I, this, that was, it was new. I mean, I looked at it, but it was just new. But anyway, in Corinth... And in, in most places of the day, men and women both wore, like I said, they wore robes, and they would differentiate through hair length. Uh, length of hair, you, you would know. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I lived in a time where my, I, you can believe it, I have pictures, but I had long, the hippie era, you know, I was a long-haired, I wasn't a hippie, I did call myself a hippie. I was kind of a long-haired country boy, but I had long hair. And if I would have been walking down the, the you know, alongside of, a, from behind, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if somebody said, look at her, or, what, you know, or something, because I looked like from behind, I had long hair. Many people had long hair back in the day. And we, we thought that was a rebellious thing, and guess what? It was. Little did we know, it was. But we didn't really take it to the where God takes it. And that rebellion ultimately was against, is against Him and the way He intended it. He made us different for a reason. For a reason. So that we can complement each other. So that we can be who we're supposed to be with each other as people. We're not the same. But there's not, uh, we're not superior or inferior. We're just not the same. We function in different capacities. And there's an order of subordination. And he set it forth here. But anyway, moving on here... Uh, Verses 7 through 10, he defends this. Look at it. This is where I stop. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's. Therefore, the woman ought to have, and, I, and by the way, a symbol is added. That is not in the language. That's an added. That's read in. That's, re that's so we can understand what the cultural norm of the day and the head covering. But what this really reads, therefore the woman ought to have authority on her head. She ought to submit to the authority. She ought to subordinate herself to the authority. And he says, because of the angels. Now he defends this God-ordained order. First, by this. Man was created in the image and the glory of God. 
That's the first thing he goes to. He goes to creation. Man was created in the image of God. What's that mean? We were given intellect, sensibility, and will. And we were told to go and exercise dominion over the world. We were given God's authority. Man was. The man was created out of the dust of the ground. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And God gave him his purpose was to exercise dominion on this earth. That's, that was what God intended. He, he made us in His image. And by the way, He stamped His holiness on us, which was lost with the fall. We see it. We could see that in people. And, it's, and we, we have that restored in Christ Jesus. We can be made holy because He's holy through faith in Christ. But, but uh, we were created in His, in His image. Now listen... And he says, and this and, and is this man is the glory of God. Look, look at it, what it says there. That's what it says. For a man, uh, for a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and the glory of God. So, so man, man, gender, Adam, the man, the male is the glory of God. That's what it says. But what's it say about the woman? She's the glory of man. Not the glory of God. We're all created in the image of God. We've all been given, we've all been given intellect, sensibility, and will. We're all created in God's image. But man, at creation, when God created man, man was the pinnacle of God's creation his creative work. He, he was unique because he bears the image of God in intellect, sensibility, and will. And in that regard, the woman does as well. But by placement of creation, it was man who is the pinnacle of the creation. It was God, Adam, who was the pinnacle of God's created work. The man was. And he was given God's uh, authority. The glory of God is His authority. It was the man who was given the, the, the mandate to exercise dominion. The woman comes under that, but on a different way. On the other side, it says, woman is the glory of man. The woman manifests man's authority and will. And you say, well, wait a minute. So He created women to be slaves to the man. That's where our mind goes. Because that's how we've been programmed. This is not right. This isn't fair. This isn't right. But if we understand it as God sets it forth here, what He's saying is, man was the pinnacle of God's creative work, but the greatest creation that God could bring out of man was woman. How did He create, how did he create the woman? He put man to sleep and took one of his ribs. He didn't form the woman out of the dust of the ground. He made woman out of the man. That's why she's called woman. She's called woman. And she is the glory of the man. Women are, are the glory of our authority. God has given us authority, but we give authority to the woman. We, we, they are our glory. They come out of us. He created us, stamped His image on us, and said, go exercise my dominion. The, our helpmate and our our. our our glory is what God created out of, out of the man. And so she is the man's glory. She has the authority as given by the man. Second, 8 and eight and 9 here. The order of creation should not indicate... Uh, the order of creation should, excuse me, indicate the order of subordination. Look at 6 and 9, what he says. He goes on, he, he goes on here, 8 and 9, excuse me, 8 and 9. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. So what he's saying is, is he's, he's building this case of subordination, and what is he saying? Man did not originate from the woman in original creation. Man was created by God. Woman originates from the man. Then he goes even further. He says, and understand that man wasn't created for the woman's sake, but the woman was created for the man. 
What, do you know the story? Genesis 2. What's it say? He's counting the animals. He's na- not counting them, but he's naming all the animals. And he doesn't find any suitable or like him at all, Adam. And what God say? This isn't good. <laughs> this is not good. This isn't good. So I'm going to create out of the man. And he creates woman. And he gives the woman to the man. And what, what did he say? This is your, she's to be what? Your help me. In doing what? Fulfilling God's mandate to go and exercise dominion over the world. So God gave the man the, the mandate. What good for man to be alone? Adam knew that. But God knew it. And God created woman who is the glory of the man. And man shares in that delegation with her that response, that the obligate or responsibility to go and exercise dominion, and they work together. She is his helpmate. That's what it says. You're looking at me. You're making all this up. No, I am not. <laughs> I am not, and you know I'm not. But we believe this. The hardest part is yielding to it. It is. It's difficult for us. And there's reasons for that, but we're not going to be able to get into all that. But then he gives another reason here. Look at it. And that is the angels are watching. Look at what he says here. Verse 10. And there's real confusion on this. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Therefore, the woman ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. See, we put symbol in there and it immediately thinks that we're talking head covering. And I I believe that he's sorting this out for us in a very clear way to where he's letting us know that the issue really isn't the head coverings. It's what the head coverings represent and by putting them off or taking them on or whatever, we're, 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 we're rebelling against what God has ordained. The issue is am I going to be subordinate? Am I going to be a, a woman? And am I going to be a man? Am I going to be what God intended me to be in the Christian community? I believe in the secular world because He went back to creation to, to make the point here. And He tells the woman, therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority or have authority on her head because of the angels... This is a, I'm going to tell you, you, you're talking six, seven positions on what this verse says. I'm, it, it is, I didn't realize it, but it's like, they're all over the place on this verse, what, what it's here. To me, it's as simple as the context. And what it's saying is, is if there's this order of subordination and understand the angels are watching, why bring the angels into play? Here's what came to my mind immediately. And then I, one of the commentators, I believe it was Gromacki, he picked up on this and I loved it. And that is, what was the original sin? I mean, with, with Satan. What was Satan's sin? Insubordination. Pride. He wanted, he wanted to be in uh, it, what, what God was he wanted to be like God. He wanted God's place. He, wanted, he did not want to subordinate himself to God. Pride welled up in his heart. And that's what, what, uh, what uh, Gromacki said. It was the sin of pride or insubordination that caused Satan and his angels to sin. Satan wanted to be like his authoritative head. Thus, we, what we find in Scripture, the angels are watching us. Did you know that? I, I don't make a big deal about it. But in Scripture, they are, very, they are involved with local churches and what's going on in here. They watch. They watch us. And what, what he's saying here is in light of what the sin was with the angelic realm and God's ordained, ordained authoritative structure, breakdown, the order of subordination, we should manifest that. So that there's no confusion. They, they, they are interested. They watch us. They're, they're, they see this. So, so he calls on uh, the woman 
to, to embrace her place. Now one, one guy goes clear back to Genesis 6. And he made a case that, that he believed that by not covering your head with the angels being present, the fallen, what, what happened in Genesis 6 with the angelic realm uh, perverting the creation order and involving themselves with the, the daughters of men, that you're a temptation to the angelic world. Now some of you are saying, I think I'm good, good looking. I could be. I don't know. But the reality is, is that that's a case as well. There were issues, but the, here's the thing. The angels are interested in us. And our God is a God of order. And He's a God of what is decent and in order. And He's not an author of confusion. And so there should never be a confusion of the genders, nor their place or role within the, the Christian community. Because it's an offense to the angels. That's how I see it. That's how I see it. Now for the, the, the ne moving on here, this next point, the third one. And these are going to be rapid fire because we need to wrap this up. I knew we'd run long. I'm sorry, but I, 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 I want to deal with this whole thing in one discussion. 11 and 12. Here's, here's the, the third point. Subordination has nothing to do with inferiority or superiority. Look at verses 11 and 12. And he lays it out pretty clear. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. We are inter interdependent. For as the woman originates from the man, she was created out of the man, so also man has his birth through the woman. So woman has her existence out of the man. And he's going to go on to say from God. But she's out of the man. Her existence is out of the man. And man's continued existence is through the woman and birth. That's what he's saying. We're interdependent. Even in the created order. And he says, and all things, where do they originate? It originates with God. From God. This is from God. That's what we have to understand. This is from God. Then he's going to go on. So his point was, it has nothing to do with inferiority versus superiority at all. We're in, interdependent. We, we need one another. We can't live without each other. We cannot continue the human race without the woman. And the woman wouldn't be here without the man being taken out of the man. Here's the third one. I mean the fourth one. Subordination... Or distinct, I like to, I, I want to change that. I like distinction or distinctiveness is natural. The distinction is natural. Look at verses 13 through 15. And what he does now is he appeals to them on the basis of what we see naturally occurring with men and women, not with the animal kingdom. Because I know some of you will be like, well, lions have long manes and the females don't have any mane. No, we're not talking about, we're talking about people. It says, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? What's he saying? Is it proper for a woman to take that sign of, of her understanding of the, subordinate, subordin, the order of subordination in the body and, and disregard that? But what he is saying even more so is, is it right for a woman to look like a man? And come before God. Look what he says in verse 14. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? What's he saying? If the man looks like a girl, it's not an honorable thing. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. That's what it says. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. If she looks like a woman and she has the, the, the hairdo of a woman and she looks like a woman, that's her glory. It's glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined... Now listen to this. This is how he wraps it up. But if one is inclined to be contentious... We have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So back to the point, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close this out here. 
this subordination is natural. His point, case in point, women naturally grow better heads of hair, more luxurious, longer. It's natural for them to have long hair. That's natural. That's a natural thing. It is not natural for a man to go around looking like a woman. You know in the law, in Deuteronomy, it is condemnable by death for women to dress like a man. Now we're not under the law. But the, but the principles are surfacing here that men should look like men and women should look like women. There should be a distinctiveness as to who we are. There should be no, no questions about it. Who, the, who, who we are. Our culture, they, they say you can put it off, put it on whatever you want. You're not in the body of Christ. Now here's, here's the final word. In, in what he says here. And, and, and you need to hear how he says it. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice nor have the churches of God. He started this whole portion and I skipped it. I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the tr traditions just as I delivered them to you. Even in spite of all their problems that were within the body of this church, those people who recognized Paul's authority and his teaching, they actually had asked him to answer many questions. And this was one of the issues Paul had to address. And he said, i got to commend you that for, by, by and large, you guys have tried to do the right things. But here's some issues that need to be addressed and we need to be clear about. And then he, after he makes this whole case, he says, but if anyone is inclined to be contentious, and what this is, who, who is endlessly wants to debate this matter, you know what Paul says? He can debate with himself. I'm not going to waste my time with him. That's exactly what this, this verse says. I am not going to waste my time debating the matter. This is what God says. This is what we, not just him, he says this is the teaching that we the apostles teach and this is the function and the practice of the true churches of God. End of matter. End of discussion. I'm not going to debate it. And he's, that's what he says. He says, it's not, it's not worth my time because nature teaches us that this is right. We know it from creation. We know this. The, the problem is, is we have fallen. We have fallen. And, and, and it messed up everything. And I'm telling you, Satan has had a heyday with this whole gender confusion within the body. Men quit being men and women trying to be men and all mixing up and whatever. It's just, it's not of the Lord at all. At all. But I'm going to close with this one portion and we'll be done. Sorry. I'm not sorry, really. I, I, I want to get this said. I want you to get it. So anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this last portion. The instructions given by Paul, and this is from the expositors. The instruction given by Paul relating to the place of women in the church were addressed to the cultural melu, uh, melu, is that it? Yeah, melu, melu, yeah, melu, of the Corinthian believers in the first century A.D. Corinth was a pagan Greek city out of which God was calling His church of, of the redeemed. The Greek, that Greek women did appear in public without a head covering is evident from ancient Greek paintings. And women in Corinth, the Corinthian church may have come to worship services in this way. Also, some Christian women who were Greeks or Jews may have been going to church with their hair disheveled or hanging loose or cropped. This might have given, given the impression that they were mourning or in, it might even imply that they had been accused of adultery. So disorder and unrest might have begun to, to mar the, the, the Christian, the worship services. The apostle wrote and wanted to correct these improprieties. And then what surfaces, he gives five principles, and I'm going to lay them out here because they're very good. He, he puts it in a nutshell. Five points. Christians should live as individuals and in corporate worship in the light of the perfect unity and interrelatedness of the persons of the Godhead. The Father and the Son are perfectly united, and yet there is a difference administratively. God is the head of Christ. So Christians are one, but they too have to admit, be administratively subordinate to one another. It's an order. It's a function thing. 
Second, Christians are to remember that God first created man, then woman, and placed the man as administrative head over the woman and the woman as his helper companion. So in the Christian community, the man is to conduct himself as a man and as the head of the woman, while the woman is to conduct herself as woman with dignity without doing anything that would bring dishonor to her. Three, since Christians live in a Christian community of the home and that of the church, they are to remember that God has established the man and the woman as equal human beings. As woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. So in the Christian community, believers should treat one another with mutual respect and admiration as they realize each, and each other's God-given special functions and positions. Four, Christian men and women should remember that though God has made them equal human beings, yet He has made them distinct sexes. That distinction is not to be blurred in their realization that they are mutually dependent. The man on the woman and the woman on the man were dependent on each other. It is also to be observed in their physical appearance so that in worship the woman can be recognized as a woman and the man as a man. Five, God is a God of order. This means order in worship and peaceful decorum in the church. Therefore, Christian men and women should conduct themselves in a respectful, orderly way, not only in worship, but also in daily life. Great principles. And that, that's exactly what's being said here. Don't, don't, we should not get bogged down on, on just the headdress issue. Was it an issue? It, it, it was. Can it even be an issue today? It can if that's, in your, if that's your culture, that's your church. If you have visible signs like that, that can be an issue. But is it a mandate? No, it's not. The mandate is, is recognize God's order of subordination and authority in the church and each, each person, uh, each gender, is to embrace who they are, their identity in God and to, and to go forth with, with clear distinctiveness in that capacity. That brings glory to God. That's, that's God's, God's will for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time here. And as heavy as this text can be, Lord, or maybe as heavy as I've made it today, I, I, I apologize for that. But Lord, it, it's an issue in our culture. And it, it, it's something that we as a body, especially as believers, we need to really be on top of this and, uh, and have, have your, your will uh, as as our desire completely, Lord. And I, I thank you for each one who's come out. Pray you bless the day, bless our activities. I know folks are, are traveling about, even with graduations, even yet. Pray you bless there. Keep each one safe. Bless your word to our hearts. And our hearts, Lord, may they be yielded to you for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.